So today I'm talking about Vivado and something called Tickle. Um, what's the goal for today? You're going to see a lot and you might learn a lot. There's two kinds of students we get to work with as faculty. Students who want you to move their elbow and tell you exactly what to do every step of the way. And students for whom you just point at the problem and they learn to dig. Can you guess which kind faculty find most productive? Yeah, the latter ones, right? So in what we talk about today and what we talk about Friday, it's as much about the process of figuring out and finding the information as it is precisely what I tell you today. And this goes doubly true for Fridays because Friday really is a self-paced, you take a deep dive into what's inside of Zilinx FPGA. Today, I'm going to lecture a little more. There will be no lecture on Friday. It's all self-paced. So pay attention to sort of the, the processes and where the information can be found, as well as to the details. Okay. Now, you've all used Vivado in classes in the past, and there's a lot of ways to use Vivado, okay? You've used one mode, which are most people probably, that's where they spend 90% of their time. You write some HDL, you create XDC files, and you say synthesize, implement, and generate bitstream. And then you download and the magic happens and the lights blink, right? Okay, so the first task that you're going to do in this unit, by the way, I should, I should back up and say, my way of doing these kinds of lectures is I'm very tightly coupled to this thing right here. And I'm expecting at least my students are going to spend a significant amount of time working through what's here to get competent with Vivado. Each of you will want to ask your professor, of all these things that are here under these tasks, et cetera, which ones would be appropriate to what I'm doing this summer? So I'm not going to assume that everybody's professor in this group today is gonna to want you to do all of them. I'm gonna want my students to do all of them, okay? Um, and for example, the, the deep dive, which is scheduled for Friday, we actually are not going to meet if I'm gonna be out of town but it's a very detailed self-paced activity that I'm expecting my students to dig through. And once again, you're gonna to wanna to ask your professor, do they want you to spend time digging your way through it? I think so. Our goal with these two lectures is to get you to look under the hood in ways you never ever have contemplated in the past. Because most of the projects going on in our little FPGA group here in the department we're not writing system Verilog and pushing synthesis buttons. We're actually writing our own CAD tools to do oddball things, which requires you know a lot about the innards of the FPGA and all the file formats that are being used and generated so that you can write your own CAD tools. So that's really our goal. But we know that some of you are gonna be very rusty. So task number one, okay, if I go to uh, this one, Task number one is to refresh your Vivado abilities with the GUI, meaning go get one of your old designs from 220, fire up Vivado, you know, create a new project. You have 220 lab wiki tutorials that will remind you how to create a new project, okay? And actually run it through the flow start to finish, all right? because some of you probably have forgotten how to run Vivado completely. So you got to get yourself up to where you were at the end of 220, where you could write some HDL and get it to run through the, to, to, the tools, okay? Um, so, you know, open it, modify it, simulate it using the simulator. This is one of the sort of pseudo optional things. Many of you won't be simulating in your projects this summer, but you know, it doesn't hurt to go back and remember how to simulate. And then we have some sub bullets here about things that we like. When, if you do need to simulate, these are things that we think you should know how to do because there's a lot of capabilities in the GUI to help make your simulation go quickly that very few students ever learn how to use. That's what these are. Second task, 
also optional. I suspect few of your, fat, your, your professors are gonna want you to do this, but we have a tutorial on how to actually write test benches to exercise your circuit instead of tickle. Okay, and that's what this, this uh, link was for because the only people who use tickle to simulate their designs and verify they're correct are students in beginning digital design courses. Nobody else on the planet does it that way, okay? We write what are called test benches. If you're simulating a Verilog design, you write a test bench in Verilog, which is essentially a module that drives signals into the real thing that you're worried about, does it work? Okay, so there's a task that um, you may do. Once again, ask your professor. But task three is, is one that I believe everyone is interested in. So there is this thing called Tickle. You used it to drive your simulations. That's not really its main use. Its main use is to do two things. One is to be the script language that allows you to say, go to this directory, bring these files in, parse them in, synthesize the design, implement it, map it to pins, and generate a bit stream. And you never see the GUI. Vivado is just an executable that this, you know, that that, that interprets this script. Okay, that's, the, that's one use for Vivado. If you're doing like, you're, you, you've written some CAD tools and you need to test them on hundreds of designs, you're not gonna open up hundreds of designs and create a project the 220 way in the GUI, right? No, oh, you're gonna write a script that just does it. You're gonna let it run for four hours and it'll run all 200 designs through. So that's, that's the first usage model. The second usage model is once you have a design open, and you've like placed and routed it, using tickle commands, you can examine what's in the design. You can say, hey, give me a list of all the flip-flops. Now draw where they are. I wanna see where they are. Um, you know, I got this net, tell me all of the pins on circuit elements that it's driving and that's all scriptable. So you're not clicking and panning and searching and zooming. That's the second usage model. So that's what we're gonna talk about today really um, is how you can use Tickle uh, to your benefit. Because what will happen is you'll say, well, but I'm writing CAD tools. I'm not gonna do anything with Vivado. Well, you'd be surprised how often you have to open up Vivado and say, hmm, uh, this is what Vivado thinks this circuit has in it and how it's all wired up. And I need to compare that to with what my CAD tool is doing. And like in my, in, in my current projects, I'm constantly opening Vivado for that purpose. But we're doing no actual, you know, application development in System Verilog, but Vivado is a tool to help us. So, okay. When you run Vivado, you've always run it in what we call the default mode. And in the default mode, it brings up the GUI and you start pressing buttons. But there's something called the tickle mode where you say Vivado dash mode tickle. And at that point, it does not start the GUI. It brings up just that tickle console prompt that was always embedded down near the bottom of the GUI. And from there, you can do everything you want. You can then start the GUI as needed if you need to look at something graphically, like once the design has been placed and routed, you can open up the GUI and look at it, but you can also stop the GUI and put it away, okay? Because if you're running a script in tickle, and if the script is doing a lot of stuff, if the GUI is open, the script runs real slow because Vivado is updating the GUI as the script runs. And so a common thing to do is you close the GUI, you run the script and you open it back up to visualize what you got, okay? So one of the first things we want you to do is to go read this BYU Tickle tutorial I wrote last year, okay? Now, almost 100% of all the things you can do in Vivado, you can do with Tickle. Because usually when you do something graphically in Vivado, it actually turns it into a Tickle command and it echoes the Tickle command down in your history buffer. And so you can do something and then you can look to see, well, what was the command to do what I just did graphically? There's a few things we have not been able to figure out how to do. The main one is, is how to zoom and pan your display. Okay, but lots of other things, most other things you can do. Now, there's a lot of references on Tickle. 
It's a follow-up programming language, was invented way back when I was a new faculty member, in fact. And um, so you can go out on the web and find lots of really in-depth tickle tutorials. I'm not convinced that's needed. By looking at other, you know, tickle scripts that we, you know, that people in your research group have created, and by looking at this Vivado Design Suite tickle command guide, you'll be able to pick up what you know. I've never went and found an in-depth tickle reference or tutorial to learn how to program in tickle. I basically use this Vivado uh, design guide reference right here and lots of experimenting and you know reading other people's scripts. Okay, so I've already said, this is the normal way to start Vivado and this is how you start Vivado in tickle mode. Now with tickle, you can write programs, meaning you can write scripts of things to execute kind of like you do in Python, but just in the tickle syntax, you can put that in a file and then you can say, by the way, I want you to run Vivado. And I don't even want to see the tickle command line prompt. I just, I want you to go open this tickle file and execute whatever's in it and then close. And so this is kind of how you would run a script across a wide range of uh, designs that you've created. But doing Vivado mode tickle is pretty common because it brings up the interactive prompt. And then maybe you would say, Okay, source this script file, but leave the command prompt open. And now I'm going to do a bunch of some things. Okay, and so that's the mode I typically work in. This is the most common mode for me. Okay, so let's talk about the first use. Okay, the first use is um, I would like, I'd like a tickle script where I can go to a directory and I can run this script and it will compile the Verilog files in that directory synthesize, implement, generate a bit stream and exit. That seems like a nice thing to have, right? Because then I could go to that directory and I could run Movado and point it at that script. And I've now generated my bit stream without all that clicking around with the mouse. So here in this uh, tutorial, I've created my version of this. It's not the best way to do it, it's a way to do it. So let's just look and you're gonna learn tickle as we go. So I'm defining a procedure called compile. Compile takes one parameter and here's the body starting with the squiggly. You can do print statements, put S, put string, it's a print statement. Okay, what I'm gonna do is if a project was already open, I'd like to close it because if you try to create a new project and you already have one open, Vivado's unhappy, okay, then I'm going to say link design and give it a part name. This is the equivalent of saying create a new design using that part. But here's something you need to understand, and I'm not going to go into detail, but Vivado has two modes. It has project mode. It has non-project mode. Project mode is what you used previously. Do you remember that you would create your project and it would create all these little subdirectories like, you know, like project one, dot sources, project one dot sim, project one dot hardware. And sometimes when your Vivado would wedge, we'd tell you to blow away those directories. That's called project mode. And that's what the GUI is set up to manipulate. But if you don't do project mode, if you just do what I've done here, and you say, hey, you know, link a design with a part. This basically says create a new design for a specific part. It's not gonna create any of that stuff, okay? Um, and we call that non-project mode. So it's just a different way to use Vivado. So once I've said, this is the part I want, I now have a design open and I say, all right, glob is a common uh, uh, command that exists, which basically says, go look for any files that match this pattern, right? You know about stars or wild cards. This basically says, give me a list of all of the files that match this pattern. And if the list uh, isn't empty, then go read those files in. So this is basically saying, I'm not really gonna add files to my project like in project mode, but look, go compile all the system Verilog files if you find any in the current directory. Now go compile all the Verilog files if you find any in the current directory. And now go compile all the VHDL files. I was covering all my bases. You don't need all three. 
But this is kind of a short, quick way, a cheap way to say, look, anything in this directory, if it's a, if it's a system Verilog, Verilog or VHDL file, just compile it for me, okay? Then, now, with those as the files of interest, please synthesize my design. The name of the top level, uh, the name of the top level module in the design, okay, is the same name as the parameter I passed into my subroutine. See that? So the way you refer to parameters you've passed into the subroutine is dollar name. And by the way, please flatten the hierarchy. I want a flat net list, meaning if there's hierarchy in the design, I want it to be gotten rid of. That's a common thing to do. Okay, now that it's been synthesized, I have an XTC file. And what's the name of the XTC file? Whatever the name of my top level module was .xtc. Do you see how I'm just creating a string name using variables and other stuff? And so this is how you process whatever XTC file you've made to map your pins to, or your inputs and outputs to the pins, okay? And then I have some comments, you know, you need to add these two things, otherwise you're gonna get errors when you generate a bitstream. This is something that, you know, the GUI does automatically. And so we add those to our script. I have another comment here that says, you know, often you don't even care where the pins get mapped because you're not gonna download it to the board. You're just trying to synthesize and implement hundreds of designs and measure how fast they're going to run according to Vivado and how many circuit elements they take. And so we even have a comment or we even have a command which basically says, uh, I'm not going to give you an XTC file, which means you would get rid of this line. Uh, and don't worry about it. Don't give me an error if I have unmapped pins because I don't really care where you've mapped the pins to. Okay, and then we place the design, we route the design. Together, those two commands are what implement design does in the GUI. So can you see, I'm just chunking through what the GUI was going to do, but with commands. Now we get to the bottom and you say, well, what do you wanna do? Well, here I'm gonna write the bitstream. Dash four says, if that file already exists, erase it and make a new copy and make a new version. There's this notion of a checkpoint which you learn about if you ever need one, but it's a, it's a way to take your existing design and dump it to a file and you can load that checkpoint in very quickly and just pick up where you left off. So it's a way of saving a project, but in non-project mode, okay? Um, so I write the bitstream and then I print all done. And I have a comment here. You might want to close the project but I usually don't because I run this script, it leaves the thing open, and now I can go in and poke around with the GUI and see what I, you know, see what I got, okay? Now, to do this, you would fire up Vivado in tickle mode. You would source the script wherever you've put this code, okay? You would source it, and that does just what you think. It reads it in and interprets it. But of course, it doesn't do anything other than define a subroutine, right? So now I need to call my subroutine, compile my design. And that means he's gonna find all the HDL files in my directory. He's gonna assume the top level module in one of those is called my design. He's gonna synthesize, place, route, and generate a bitstream called my design dot bit. Pretty cool. Okay, so you can cannibalize this and you'll, you'll find use for it. Yes? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, if you put your pins, you know, all spread around the chip, they've got to run wires to wherever things are getting done. So, you know, often planning where you're going to map the IOs to takes some work and it, it, it takes some energy. Yeah. So, yep. Okay. Any questions on this so far? You know, last year, at least my students, they, they took this and they cannibalized it and they used it for a lot of their work during the summer. It's, it's, it's a nice thing to have. And of course, I've seen really exotic and involved and detailed ones. This one's pretty bare bones, but it works quite well. Yes. 
through, let's see, if you scroll down a bit, the, this one you have commented about unconstrained pins. Yeah. I hadn't seen that before. I found one. Oh, you found a different way to do it. Oh, place ports. Oh, okay. I don't know about place ports. Randomly assigns top or nets to ports. Okay. Oh, okay, so you didn't know about it. So I was going to ask you about that one. No, I don't know the difference. Yeah, see, I've always assumed that this one says the pin, the, the top level IO pins have not been mapped to IOBs. Okay. Don't worry about it. Whereas yeah. yours is actually going to map them. That's right. And so his might be better than this one. That's good to know. It's called place ports. Yeah. And does it take arguments or does well, it? It's like place design, place underscore ports. Place ports. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, um, my student who did the BRAM patcher, you know, he needed this ability because he wasn't placing ports at all. And, you know, this is what we found to do that. So that's good to okay. know. Thank you. Great. So, oh. what? Go ahead. But you say they don't get assigned to an IOB, but. Well, well. They must. Something is happening. Okay. But my understanding is what we're saying is allow unconstrained pins. Okay. See, so maybe later it assigns them something. Right? Or it's also possible that no, they don't get mapped, and so 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 yeah, doing this would not that. work well if you're worried about maximum clock rate, right? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I honestly don't know. That's a good question. I think place ports is newish. Oh, maybe so. Yeah. See, I thought placing the ports was the default behavior, and so. I was surprised when we when we had the error that required this command to be added. Yeah, if you don't constrain them. It, in the old days, mm -hmm. you would just place them. Yeah. I, they weren't where you wanted, so it didn't work on your board, but it would at least place them. But yeah, so I don't know. Okay, other questions, comments? Okay, let's move on to the second half then. The second half is if I have a design open, I can do interesting things with it. So let's look at some other functionality and then I'm just going to do a demo. I'm going to open up Vivado. So this is called, uh, this is a little simple design analyzer script I wrote. Okay, so let's just see what it's going to do. Okay, so I'm once again, I'm defining a procedure, print cell statistics. Okay, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to pass in, it, it takes one parameter, but if I don't specify the parameter, there's a default value. So, you know, this is a lot like Python with default, you know, parameter values, yada, yada. It's just a different syntax. Okay, you'll notice that I can open files. So I'm going to open a file. And now my put S can take a file pointer. And so now what am I going to do? I'm going to say, I'm going to call a function called get property. And the property I'm interested in is called top. But I'm interested in the top property that's associated with the current design. So if I have a design open, get design is a function that will return a pointer to the design that's currently open. Anytime you call a function, you have to wrap it in square brackets so that you get the return value for use. So get design will return a pointer to the current design. I'm going to call get property and I'm going to say, I want to know what the value of the top property. There's a property associated with the designs called pop. And you can guess what it is. It's the name of the top level module in the design. And designs have lots of other properties. This is one. And so notice I'm just going to say print benchmark colon, and then it's going to print the name of the benchmark. That's what this all will do. And you'll see a pattern whenever you call a function and you want to use the return value, you have to wrap it in square brackets. And you nest square brackets if you want. Then I'm gonna put some, you know, some uh, um, uh, dashes. I've got a commented outline here. And now look, here's another one. I'm gonna call the get cells method, which is a Vivado built-in tickle command that says, give me a list of all of the cells in the current design. And the cells would be things like, you know, your Verilog got mapped onto lookup tables and flip flops, right? Those are called cells, okay? And they're logical things. So call get cells, 
I want you to go through the whole hierarchy and I don't, I want you to be quiet about it because usually commands will echo things as they were. So this right here will give me a list of all the cells in the current design. I'm gonna take that list and I'm gonna call the function called L length, list length. So you can see, this is how you get the cell count. You say, give me a list of all the cells, call the function to measure the length of the list and print that as a part of our print string. So I'm printing how many cells there are. I'm gonna do the same thing. How many nets are there? Okay, there's a thing called sites. And I'm gonna say, within the FPGA, there are sites, things like, they're, they're called slices. And that's where the LUTs and the flip-flops live. And I say, give me a list of all the sites, but I want you to filter on the sites whose is used property is true. In other words, I want a list of all the sites who have something placed inside of them. Because you got this huge FPGA with 150,000 sites, but your design might only be using 200. So this gives me a list of the sites that are used. Okay, Measure the length of the list and print it. So you're starting to get a feel for how this language works. It's very tightly tied in to Vivado, right? Tickle is a generic language, but Xilinx preloads their Tickle interpreter with all these things that allow you to ask things about your design. Okay, then what do I do? Well, let's see. I'm going to set a variable called cell distribution map with whatever this subroutine so there's obviously a subroutine later that's going to do that. And I take whatever it returns and I set it to this variable. And then I do some weird stuff with a dictionary, which I am not going to talk about, but dictionaries exist inside uh, Tickle. And if you've programmed much in Python, you've run across dictionaries. Okay. Uh, but yeah, and so I'm, I'm, I'm doing a, a dictionary for loop and printing a bunch of stuff, okay? And notice in the print, inside the quotes, I can put, you know, backslash T for tab. I could put backslash N for new line. I can put variables, okay? When you assign to a variable, you do not use a dollar sign. When you use the variable, you, at, you, you reference it using the dollar sign as if, this is a pointer and to get at the contents, you put a dollar sign in front, kind of like in C, right? Okay, yeah. And then I close my file. And here's another, and, and, and here's the, that generate cell distribution dictionary, it takes no parameters. I create a dictionary that's empty. And then I loop across all the cells in the list of all of the cells in my design and I add them to my dictionary. Okay, and we're not going to go through the details, but you get the idea that you can write very sophisticated scripts that will walk through your Vivado design and compute statistics and trace signals and tell you anything you want to know about your design. Okay, so, you know, you're going to be able to read this because this is linked. This, this, this is linked on your activity page. So I'm not going to go through the rest of it, but you know, this goes through all the lines of the script, tells you how things work. Um, at this point, I want to talk about properties and then we're just going to dive in and I'll spend the next 25 minutes. Everything in Vivado has, a, has properties. Cells have properties. Tiles, designs, wires, nets, pins. Okay, everything has properties. So for example, if you want to know, if you know that there is a cell in your design called a ibuff inst, then you can get a handle to that cell by calling get cells with the name, and you can pass that as a parameter to the report property method. And he just will dump out a list of, here's every property, okay? Is the name of the property, the type of the property, is it read only, meaning can you change it? from tickle, and if the property has been set to a value, then here's the value. So for example, notice we've got, um, let's see. Oh, what, what would be an interesting one? So this is the cells in my designer. So here's one I like, 
Loke says, has that cell been placed onto a specific circuit element somewhere in the FPGA? Because when you synthesize your design, you get a net list, a bunch of LUTs and flip-flops. The placement step decides where on the FPGA those are going to be physically placed. The loc property tells you where a given cell was placed. It says, oh, yeah, that cell is placed on this oops, circuit element, IOBX0, Y101, okay? He, you know, he has a name, et cetera. Okay, so the other thing you could do is if you didn't want to get all of them, you can say, hey, I won't, give me the loc property of a given cell where the cell has been assigned to C. But, you know, you saw some filtering. Look at this one. Give me all the pins in the design mapping, matching any name. That's what the star means. But I now want you to filter them. I want the direction property be, to be in, and I want the name to not contain the word reset. You get the idea? So, okay. Now we're just going to dive in and you'll see how, what the rest of this is. One of the powerful things that I have been using a lot lately is to mix Tickle and the GUI. You'll learn how to write these Tickle scripts, et cetera. But I've, I've I found some, yeah, you want to turn off a light for us? That's going to be hard to see. And I don't know how to make this bigger. So those of you in the back, you might want to come forward if you want to read. I, I don't know how to tell Vavado to make everything I don't bigger. think you can. I, <laughs> I've given up on that. You've given up on that. Okay. So this view is a view you may not have seen a lot of. When you, uh, look, even if you're using the GUI, if you, you know, synthesize and implement the design, then you can open the implemented design. And when you open the implemented design, it says, okay, I'm going to show you a picture that represents the FPGA, the physical layout of the FPGA. And you can see that, yeah, you can see it from where you are. There's little colored things, and those are showing used tiles and sites. So that, that helps you see where your circuit got mapped. If you have a big circuit, you might see some funny shaped blob right in the middle or down in a corner. This circuit is so trivial, there's not much there. This is called the device browser. At least that's what I call it. I'm not sure what it's really called. It has some interesting features, which I'm going to turn off for a minute. And now I'm going to zoom in. You can do view, zoom, but you can also do control R, and that will allow you to zoom in to a little section of the circuit. We're just going to zoom into this corner right here. And as I start to zoom in, you start to see a two-dimensional array of things. And if I zoom in even farther, okay, you say, oh, well, look, I see some lots. I see some flip-flops. Now, you didn't recognize them, but after you've done this a couple of times, you go, yep, that's what we call a slice. And there's his name, slice underscore X0, Y94, and he's of type slice L. But these two slices are embedded inside something called CLBLL underscore L, X2, Y94. And so you can wander around the circuit, and if things are used, they're highlighted. That means some cells were placed on these elements inside the slice. And if they're not highlighted, it means there's nothing there. Now, one thing you can do is you can click. So I'm gonna click on a flip-flop and this pane over here, can you see where my mouse is now? This pane is really quite helpful if you're in the GUI mode because if you select something, then it puts it over here in the properties pane and it tells you things about it, okay? It says, well, it's a cell. He's called count underscore reg three. He's an FDRE cell, which is a flip, a D flip flop, okay, with a reset and an enable input. Okay, he's something called a bell. He's in this site, which is in this tile, which is in this clock region. But he has properties, and this is what that report property was giving you from Tickle. Okay, so you can wander around, and and some of them you can click and change properties. Others are read only. Okay, so 
If you click on something though that has no cell mapped onto it, it says, ah, oh, well, you've clicked on what we call a bell. And a bell is a little piece of circuitry that's, in the, that's built into the FPGA. Cells get mapped onto bells by the tools, okay? So, but, but he's not blue, which means nothing has been mapped onto him. And so when I clicked, I selected him and it reports the bell. And he says, you're a bell, okay? You're in a slice L, you have a name, okay? You are a reg init, that's your type of bell, meaning a flip-flop. Bells also have properties, okay? Bells have pins, input and output pins. So graphically, you can nose around and you can see what's going on, but we're going to see how to do all of this with Tickle as well. Yes? I, I get confused. I always think like the FPGA should have one XY coordinate system. Thank you for bringing that up. They it doesn't, doesn't, right? It doesn't. How many are there? Oh, probably 30. Really? Oh, okay. I don't know. There's a lot. Back to your general. There's at least three there. There's the clock region, the file, and the site. But more. well, yeah, because my understanding is that BRAMs, for example, BRAM tiles will have their own numbering system. Oh, their own. They're on their own grid. I, you know, I'm only partially sure of that. I just have been. I mean, every time I turn around, it's a new coordinate system. <laughs> Um, you know, maybe all the tiles do use a uniform one. I know that within tiles, there are sites and they use their own numbering, si different sites, you know, slices use one numbering system. Um, URAM, you know, primitives use their own. Well, they all start in the bottom left zero zero, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So let's zoom out a little bit because Dr. Goder said something interesting. So I'm going to click. Okay. I've just selected a tile. And so your FPGA is a 2D array of tiles, but inside tiles, there are slices. This is a CLB LL underscore L tile, and all those letters mean something. It's a configurable logic block tile, meaning it's the kind of tile that holds LUTs and flip-flops. LL means it has, it has two slices in it, both of which are slice Ls. There's also something called the slice M you'll learn about on Friday, okay? And the underscore L says there's two flavors. There's a left and a right version based on how they're mirrored across or how they're placed across the circuit. So I've selected that tile, but if I then select inside of it, notice I now get a slice, okay? This is one of the two slices that was in the tile and there's the other one. But if I zoom in, on a slice, then I can select bells because slices contain little logic elements called bells, basic element of logic. Well, and so can you see there's a hierarchy of physical things that are built into the FPGA? Your cells get mapped onto individual bells, but the FPGA itself is organized as a bunch of bells are called a slice. Technically, they're called a site. A slice is a kind of a site, but it's the hierarchy is tiles, sites, bells. Okay. And so if you have a flip flop in your barrel log code, it's going to get mapped to a flip flop bell. And here's four of them right here. Okay. And then there's one that nothing has been mapped to. Okay. Um, if you have logic gates, remember you learned that they get mapped to LUTs on Monday? Here's a LUT. Okay. Uh, well, I got the cell when I clicked. If I click again, it will get the underlying bell. So here's a bell. It's called the B6 LUT. Okay. But as you can see, this cell has been mapped to the B6 LUT because it says right here, that bell is mapped to slice L dot B6 LUT. So if you wander around, you will start to get a feel for exactly how things are being mapped. In a lot of our work, we have to understand this and figure it out. Okay. Um, you have buttons up here, you know, that allow you to zoom in and out. There's a couple of buttons I want to point out. The most important button for me is, is, is this one, the routing resources, because all this is showing is the logic elements. 
We can tell that these are used, but we don't see anything about wires. So if I click this one, the view changes quite a bit, which is unfortunate, but it does. This is that same slice, but now it's it, it looks a little different. But if we zoom in, now we can see, ah, the output of this lot runs through this part of the circuitry and into that flip-flop. And we can even see that here is one of those programmable routing things that Professor Goder talked about on Monday. And it draws the line right through it to say, that has been configured to select that input. So you can now trace wires through your design. Okay. Okay. So kind of interesting. And so one of the things we sometimes have to do, we got to look inside and we got to figure out who's hooked to who and the GUI can help. All right. I'm you kind of, up. whoops. Uh, go ahead. You zoom out. That one's cool. It goes out and around and back in again. Yes. Yes. Let's just keep zooming out. <laughs> look at this. Yeah. So that one little signal I followed, he goes out and he goes all over and comes back in and yeah, they're pretty, yeah, sometimes it's it's pretty hard to trace what's happened. Okay. All right. Um, what I want to talk about next is the sort of things we might do. So we had, we have a cell. We'll just find a cell. Here's a cell. There he is. Okay. So I could say set, whoops, set C to be get cells. And the cell I want is Q underscore O buff underscore inst underscore I underscore one. Now, if, if I knew the first few letters were all it was needed, I would just type those. You can put, you know, asterisk for wild cards, et cetera. Okay. I now have a pointer. Whoops. The C variable now points to that cell. And if I put S C, it gives me the name of the cell. And I should make this a little bigger so you can see what's happening. So I say put, put S dollar C. Yep, that's the cell. Okay. Now I can say select objects dollar C. And it's as if I had clicked that in the GUI. So let me click something else in the GUI. Okay. I'll go over here and click that guy in the GUI. Now let's re-execute this command. Okay. Select objects dollar C. Boom. So from tickle, I can select objects and they highlight. Okay. And then I can say, I can say highlight objects. Okay. Um, okay. And I can color objects and there's a lot I can do here. Um, you know, one of the things I might do is I might say, okay, I want to do the following. I want to, I want to go get a tile. Okay. How about we'll do this and I'll explain what this is. Oh, let's get tile number 125. I assume there's that many tiles. So what did I just do? I said, get all the tiles in the part. Now that gives me a list, call the L index function and grab element 125 and set it to the variable T. That's what the 125th one is in the list. Something a little more interesting might be, how about let's go grab a CLBLL and let's like grab number 35, okay? All right, oops, what did I do wrong? CL, oh. Uh, do I got to do that? There we go. So there's the third. I mean, it's it's a random CLB tile, right? Okay. But then I can say select object. Okay. With that tile. And you say, well, fine, but where is it? Well, if I were to zoom way out, we might could spot it. Is it that one? Okay. But of course, one thing you can do is you can say, fit selection, which means zoom to the thing that I selected using my tickle command. And boom, there it is. So wherever that was. I, so, so that's why I say I often have the GUI open with my tickle because I'm trying to see what I'm getting.
but often I don't because I'm just writing scripts to analyze things, okay? Um, what else could I do? How about we do this? Let, let's do this. We're going to say um, um, set S to be get sites of dollar T. But of course, I don't want all of them. I just want one of them. So how about if I do this L index and let's get the, the first site in that. Okay, there it is. And he's called slice X2, blah, blah, blah. And then I could say select objects on dollar S. There he is. He was inside the thing we had highlighted. Okay, so um, these are the kinds of things you would do to zero in on stuff. Or maybe you say, get this cell and get his loc property because that will help you decide which site and bell that cell was placed on. That would be a typical thing to do. I can do other things. I can say, get... Get the pins of dollar S. In other words, S is a site. Sites have pins. So give give me all the pins of dollar S. Okay. Whoops. Oops. I gotta say dash of. Nope. What happened? What did I do wrong? No pins. Well, no. I mean, he's a slice. He's got to have pins. Maybe they're called slice pins or site pins. I don't know. Now I'm now I'm feeling, oh, there it is. Get site pins. Ah, okay. So that site has a bunch of pins where signals enter and exit it on the boundaries. I now have a list of those. And so I could write a for loop that says for every pin in that list, print his name and print his direction. Print the wire that's connected to that pin if there is a wire connected to that pin. Okay, those are the kinds of things that you might be able to do using your nickel. Okay, so I'm about there. That's actually about what I had prepared. Um, the key here is you, you know, don't assume everything can be done graphically. Learn how to use tickle and get good with it. Um, I've had some students even recently who just were really not very good with um, um, Tickle. And, you know, there are a lot of things they just couldn't do. They didn't realize what they could do. And so they would poke around in the GUI forever. Now, Tickle is a pretty elaborate language. It looks primitive because everything is just square brackets and function calls. Um, but there's a lot there that, you know, it has dictionaries, it has lists, you can do string processing, uh, you can do file IO, et cetera. But for, for me, the power is, is how I can query and do things in Novato. Now, everything we've done here is querying the design. I can actually place a cell. There is a place cell command and you give it a handle to a cell and you give it a handle to a bell. And it will place that cell on the bell and return either a success or a failure code. So if you wanted to, you wouldn't want to, but if you wanted to, you could place and route your design all with tickle command. Okay. You could say for each cell in my net list, depending on the cell type, go find a location and place the cell onto it. If you try to place a lot onto a flip-flop bell, you'll get a failure. It'll you'll get a return code that says can't do that. It's great. Okay. So one idea would be take all loop across all the cells in your design and take that cell and just loop through every bell in the entire design until you find one he can be placed on. And you could you would come up with a legal placement of that. Okay. There's also commands like uh, there are commands to route individual nets. Okay, so not only can you analyze your circuit and query it, but you can build stuff. And so there are people who have written tools that would take a design, open it up, and go in and make changes to it, move things around or, or what have you to accomplish some purpose. Okay, now let's talk about Friday. On Friday, there is a, uh, there is a page here. Um, Okay, there is a page called the Vivado 7 Series FPGA Deep Dive. 
There will be no physical lecture here in this room, but it is a detailed set of activities. It tells you to go find the CLB guide. It even gives you the version number that I found um, so that the figure numbers match up. And then it has a whole series, you know, go look at this figure, figure out how to do this, print that, answer this question. We talk about distributed RAM. We talk about shift registers, wide muxes carry logic. We talk about BRAMs and, and distributed memory. We talk about, huh, we barely talk about the DSP. We talk about IO blocks a little bit, just enough to understand in how they're configured to be input versus output. Okay, uh, then, then we talk about, um, Xilinx has documentation that tells you, if you want to write Verilog code that will map onto this particular block, here's how you write it to guarantee you get what you wanted. If you don't write it quite right, the synthesizer will do his best, but he might, he might build your big memory out of 40,000 flip-flops, which is probably not what you wanted. <laughs> you wanted it to use the one little memory block that's really dense. And so the Friday stuff points you to those coding guidelines leads you through a few examples. It then also points you to the library's guide. There are building blocks in the FPGA that you may want to use, and there is no way to write always FF or always COM blocks that will ever generate that block. And the example I use here is a clock generator. There's a built-in clock generator. You bring in a 100 megahertz clock, and you can configure it to output a 33 megahertz clock and a 50 megahertz clock and a 100 megahertz clock with their phases adjusted in some very specific way. And there's no always FF block that'll generate that circuit. And so the library's guide is where you go to learn how to instance that specific building block. So that's what Friday is all about. And you can have your students work through as much or as little of that as you want. I was just gonna say that block is pure magic. So it is pure magic. You just but ask for something and it comes out. That's right. But sometimes you gotta use it. And so you wanna understand that sometimes you have to instance specific blocks, but in their coding guidelines, they say, well, for a lot of our blocks, if you write your memory description a certain way, you'll get block rounds. You won't get 40,000 flip-flops, but you have to write it the correct way. And so that's what the Friday stuff is all about.